Joshua Blank, Research Director at the Texas Politics Project at UT. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. So the legislative session begins on Tuesday. How are you expecting the session to size up and shape up? Well, you know, at this point in the in the process, you know, really what we're kind of focusing on here is the battle over agenda control. You know, right now, what we're really focusing on is what are the priorities of the key players? You know, in particular, what are the governor's priorities? What are the lieutenant governor's priorities? What are the speaker's priorities? And really, do those priorities line up or not? And so really, you know, when we're you know here in Texas, which is, you know, very famous for its limited government, we don't really expect the legislature to come in and then just start passing legislation. In fact, they can't in most cases. But what we are going to see is this sort of continued public discussion that's going to become, you know, really ever more present about what really are the priorities of this session and, and this legislature. And as typical, you know, the very first thing after they are sworn in, um, they are the House will choose its next speaker. Um, most likely it'll be Dade Phelan, the current speaker. Um, but Tony Tinderholt of Arlington, Republican, has said he's going to run. He lost uh, his chance within the GOP conference. Um, how do you expect this to to size up? I expect this to be pretty uneventful. Uh, you know, if you want to see a real race for the speaker, you should watch what's going on in the U.S. Congress. Uh, what's going on in Texas most likely is that Dade Phelan will be reelected speaker of the Texas House very comfortably. Uh, you know, the question is whether or not he you know, like like Kevin McCarthy, will be forced to make some concessions, you know, to members of his caucus. But I think realistically, you know, uh, the person who we would expect to be speaker is the last speaker. And, and it's very unlikely that, you know, we're going to see something different from that. One thing I did want to ask you about is the, the debate um, among Republicans as to whether there should continue to be Democratic committee chairs. And uh, some Republicans say there shouldn't be any more, and they they cite the fact that uh, the Democrats left Austin during the last session, enforcing multiple special sessions, as as you know, you know, they're saying this should, should this should be an outcome where there shouldn't mm -hmm. be any more Democratic Party uh, committee chairs because of that. How do you think this is going to end up? Well, you know, the speaker has been very clear that, you know, he believes in the importance of having bipartisan committee chairs. Uh, you know, this is, you know, you, you brought up, you know, Representative Tinterholt's challenge uh, to, to Speaker Phelan, and, and a large, you know, part of the rationale for that challenge is the fact that uh, Speaker Phelan has, like speakers before him, has appointed Democratic committee chairs to some committees. Uh, you know, I suspect that the process will continue. Uh, ultimately, you know, with the Democrats leaving during uh, the last legislative session and, and breaking the quorum, that certainly does strengthen the argument of those who don't want to see Democratic committee chairs. Uh, but the reality is, is that, you know, I think for Speaker Phelan and for a lot of House members, you know, this is one of the few areas where uh, you can point to and see bipartisanship. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy, I think, to sort of lose sight of the fact that you know, the legislature considers thousands and thousands of bills every legislative session, and we tend to focus on maybe 20 or 30 that, that, that peak sort of the public's interest because they're, you know, shocking in one way or another or really important to other people. But the vast majority of bills that the legislature considers, I mean, you know, 99% of them are really about the day-to-day -day functioning of government and, and, and the rules of the road. And on a lot of those things, Democrats and Republicans work together. And that may surprise a lot of people, but but that's the reality of it. And so a thing like Democratic committee chairs, you know, can become sort of subsumed in this broader political argument about, you know, these hot button issues. But this is actually some of the grease that makes the real functioning of the legislature work a little bit more smoothly. And so that's why I suspect it will hold that we'll still see Democratic committee chairs. But if we don't, the flip side of that is that that really gives Democrats in a lot of ways the go ahead really to be as difficult as they want in terms of trying to slow down the process. One of the biggest issues this session, I think, will, will that will be debated is property tax relief. And the lieutenant governor uh, came out last month and said he he's obviously supports uh, property tax relief, but says we're not going to spend all of the surplus while doing it. And I'm, I'm wondering 
you know, because some people are saying if it's about property tax relief, it's okay to spend more money uh, because it's going back to the public. Right. So uh, what do you make of these arguments? Well, the reality is, is this is extremely complicated. I mean, the first thing is, is that there is a constitutional spending cap. And so that from one session to the next, the budget can only go up by a predetermined amount that's a basically determined by the legend is determined to be a function of population growth and inflation. So there's a fair amount of wiggle room there, but there's not $27 billion of wiggle room, which is the current estimate of what that budget surplus is going to look like. The governor feels that it has made the, the statement that he'd like to see half of that budget surplus go to property tax relief. The problem is, is that would almost immediately eat up the entirety of the money that they would be allowed to spend based on constitutional limits on spending. And so all the other priorities that people would also like to see addressed basically would go out the window. The lieutenant governor has been very clear in the past that he is not amenable to, to taking uh, surpluses and expending them on continuous uh, commitments, which a property tax reduction would necessarily be a continuous commitment. For example, if they were to increase uh, the homestead exemption, that's something that they would have to pay for every single session. And this surplus really is only here this session. So that's some of the ways in which that issue is complicated, but but the, there are actually other ways in which it becomes complicated because ultimately to give to provide property tax relief uh, requires uh, tinkering with the system of finance for public education because property taxes are the primary source of public education financing. Public education in and of itself is an issue area that is, is very, very crowded this legislative session. And simply tinkering with the public education finance system in and of itself could be a job for the public education committee for the entirety of the session if that was their main job. And so the point I'm making about all this is to say, you know, yes, I think all everyone can agree, you know, at least in, in, in the Republican leadership that they want to address property taxes, they want to provide some relief to taxpayers. We know in, in our polling that we've done uh, at the Texas Politics Project at UT Austin, that voters were least satisfied with the legislature's handling of property taxes last session across a range of issues It was down near the bottom. Uh, and so we know that, that the legislature wants to do something to address this and just generally housing costs as best as they can. But the reality is this isn't something where you can just go and say, we're going to deal with property taxes because actually it fundamentally affects the budget. It fundamentally affects public education. And so it's it's really a thicket of issues that is not one that can easily be disentangled. So you're not expecting what we saw in the 2019 legislative session where there was a real dramatic um, redo, if you will, or tinkering of the public education financing. I think that's highly unlikely because in 2019, uh, the legislature did all the groundwork leading up to it. So there were many interim hearings during the summer in which the legislature was preparing itself to uh, make fundamental changes to the public education finance system and in turn property taxes because there was agreement going into that session that they were going to address property taxes and to address property taxes, you need to address public education finance. Ultimately, going into this session, there's a lot of talk about property taxes, but there's not really been any of the necessary talk about how else you make the school districts whole while somehow reducing property taxes. And, you know, when you talk about uh, schools uh, this session, you're also going to have to talk about public safety and keeping those kids safe in school so that we don't see another Uvalde. Well, and so, add you know, there's that and mental health. Those are that the, those are big dollar amounts that the legislature is going to be talking about. No, you know, uh, a, a smarter public policy analyst than I once once made the point to be that you know when you start talking about Texas public education, it's such a huge system that anything, even the smallest thing, you say, well, let's make sure that every kid has a pack of pencils. Well, you know how that's very expensive. Texas is a big place. And, and to your point, you know, we're already talking about the fundamental financing of it. You also mentioned school safety. Uh, there's also learning loss from COVID that, you know, testing is showing has, has been pretty rampant. The lieutenant governor would love to see a school voucher program, which is a highly contentious issue, uh, you know, especially in the Texas House of Representatives. Uh, you know, and there's also all the culture war issues uh, that are being pursued regarding uh, the teaching of race and sex in public schools, and not to mention you know, what sports teams transgender athletes can play on and, and, and the books available in public school libraries. 
And so that's the, that's the thing about this. You start talking about property taxes, and then you start move very quickly to public education financing. And then you're talking about an area where I think, you know, ultimately, there are a lot of potential issues that the legislature could address, but there's only 140 days, and their ability to address all of them is almost nil. And another issue that's going to be coming up was obviously discussed. The last session was discussed during the governor's race, and that's the grid and how to fix uh, the state's long term. How does the electricity market work? How does the gas system uh, work uh, in this state to prevent what we saw in the winter storm of 2021? And some lawmakers have already balked at the proposal by ERCOT and the Public Utility Commission of Texas. Yeah, well, and I think what's what's so interesting about this topic in particular is that, you know, there's disagreement among state leadership about how effective they have been or whether they have even done enough to fix the grid uh, based on what happened in February of 2021. And so this is a, a very big, complicated area. Not only do we see disagreement maybe between the governor and the lieutenant governor in terms of sort of just their assessment of the problem, but you're also talking about an issue area with huge, well-heeled industrial players, various institutional players, in addition to, to the, the political uh, calculations, really, of you know, the governor and the lieutenant governor in being you know, able to effectively convey that they've addressed this issue. And you know, ultimately, I think you know what you're going to see here is you know, when it comes to this. I mean, it's interesting. It's one of the most important issues in the state, but it's also one of the the hardest to understand because of you know, I think the complexity of the electricity market. And so, ultimately, this is not an issue that's going to go away. Uh, the lieutenant governor has said it's a priority, but you know, there's no clear consensus on what addressing the grid is going to look like in this session. He, he has said he wants uh, more natural gas plants. And I think the governor agrees with him on that, but some members of the legislature are not necessarily, um, you know, they, they don't really care what it is, whether it's natural gas or renewables, they just want something uh, more reliable. Well, yeah, they, I mean, what they want is they want the market to work, but to work reliably. And that's, I think, you know, and I think ultimately, you know, determining what that looks like is something that is going to require, you know, extensive continued discussion. It might require multiple sessions, really. And I mean, we're already in the second session of, of addressing the grid. Border security uh, is, is obviously still a very big issue here in the state of Texas. And last session, we saw the legislature really spent ramped up spending dramatically. Um, and I don't see that changing. Do you? No, and, and the reality is is that that's only a fraction of the of the spending ramp up that took place under Operation Lone Star. Uh, the, you know, the legislature significantly increased, as you said, you know, spending for border security in the last session. But then, throughout the intervening period, the governor has been able to shift money around within different agencies to expand uh, spending on Operation Lone Star to at this point, you know, north of four billion dollars over the course of this biennium. The legislature has, you know, either tacitly provided its consent, if not its blessing, to this massive increase in spending. But now the rubber is going to meet the road, and they're going to have to come back and make the agencies whole that the that the governor has borrowed from uh, to fund these operations, and or put in a line on a budget that says that Texas is now spending north of four billion dollars on border security every biennium. I think there's a high likelihood of of something like that happening because polling has can continue to consistently show that among Texas Republican voters, the number one issue they perceive facing the state is immigration or the border. And that's you know, the view of between 50 and 66 percent of Republican voters in survey after survey. And so there's really no cost in a lot of ways, you know, other than monetarily, uh, to Republican elected officials to continue to provide uh, money for border security funding. And there very well might be a, a significant political cost to doing anything that would be seen as drawing back that commitment. And President Biden is going to El Paso uh, on Sunday, uh, several days before we're recording this, or several days after we're recording this interview. But um, what do you make of the fact that he's going to the southern border for the first time in his presidency? 
Well, I mean, this has been a, a constant criticism from from Republicans and especially Texas Republicans that, that Joe Biden has not visited the border in his presidency. Uh, I think this is an acknowledgement on the part of the Biden administration that Democrats need to make a more serious effort to address the border or at least to be seen as addressing the border. Um, you know, the reality is, I think, you know, Beto O'Rourke suffered mightily in Texas uh, in 2022 against Greg Abbott, simply because of the fact that he did not really have an effective response when it came to what is the Democrats' plan for the border. And so I think this is really a, a first step uh, on the part of Joe Biden, really on the part of Democrats to say, okay, we need to take this issue seriously, even though it's not an issue that's of great importance to a large number of our voters. But it's a great issue of importance to the vast majority of Republicans and a significant number of independents. We can't simply cede this issue. And that's what Democrats have been doing. And I think what's going to be interesting to see is, you know, how effective is, effective is Biden at, you know, beginning to recast, you know, perceptions around Democratic seriousness around, around the issue of the border. And then abortion. Uh, we know that uh, the law has changed. Uh, since the last session uh, in in Texas, and I'm wondering, do you think that there are going to be there's going to be any change in state law? Um, because we know that uh, several months ago, uh, before the election, uh, one of the Republican state senators, Robert Nichols, uh, said that he would be open to having an exception for rape. There is none now. The only exception is for saving the life of the mother. Um, I've spoken with the former House Speaker uh, of Texas and uh, Dennis Bonin, and he didn't think there would be any changes. So wh what do you think? Well, I wouldn't bet against Dennis Bonin's <laughs> handicapping uh, of what the House is going to do, that's for sure. Uh, you know, I, I think that's a reasonable expectation. I mean, look, I think going into this session, the legislature has two basic options, you know, in front of it when it comes to what it's going to do around abortion laws. One would be to expand access to the cases of rape and incest, which would bring the law significantly more in line with public opinion in the state. The other route would be to focus on further enforcement mechanisms, you know, trying to crack down on uh, abortion pills being sent through the mail, trying to uh, disincentivize companies from providing travel expenses to women you know, seeking abortions, things of that nature. The reality is, is that after a session in which they passed you know, one of the strictest abortion uh, bills in the country, despite a public that was clearly opposed to it, there's no reason to think going into the next session after winning a majority of you know both seat, you know both houses in the legislature winning every statewide office by comfortable margins that they would immediately backtrack uh, on their accomplishments. And one thing, one area that Republicans and Democrats seem to agree is on spending more money when it comes to the health and safety of uh, expectant mothers and you know mothers who you know. A postpartum after they've given birth. Uh, do you do you get that sense as well? Yeah, they made a the legislature made a, a pretty uh, you know, significant effort. I mean, it depends on you know it's in the eye of the beholder, but I would say made a significant effort in the last session to deal with uh, the maternal mortality crisis that Texas is is continuing to face. Uh, I think you know the reality was is that bill did not go far enough in providing postpartum depression. Uh, support, which has led to some problems in terms of, you know, federal waivers and, and some other, you know, sources of funding for that program. So it would be surprising to see the legislature come back and try to try to align that program with federal requirements. Uh, ultimately, the House passed, I think, uh, you know, more protections than the Senate, and that was where the conflict was. But I think this is an example of, you know, the way that the legislature normally operates, which is that, you know, most big issues take a few sessions to get to the end point. And so I think this is an issue that, as you pointed out, both Democrats and Republicans do want to deal with. And hopefully, you know, this time around, they'll be able to provide, you know, Texas mothers with the type of care that they obviously so desperately need. Joshua Blank, Research Director at the Texas Politics Project at UT Austin. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your insight as always. Thanks for having me.